In the summer of 1982, Tom G. Palmer, who some of you here may have heard of, was walking home from a restaurant with a friend of his. And he became aware that he and his friend were being followed. And the group of followers persisted in growing in size until there were more than 20 of them. They were skinheads and they began to yell at Tom and his friend. They yelled, faggot, homo, queer, we're going to kill you. And finally, they'll never find your bodies. Tom's friend bolted, he was terrified. Tom started to run as well. But he managed to stay just far enough ahead to get his nine millimetre handgun from his backpack and turned on his pursuers. And, needless to say, they were somewhat surprised. Although in one of those extraordinary moments where the things that someone says punch through weird and come out the other side, the first words out of the mouth of the leading skinhead were, do you have a license for that? (laughs) He then thought better of it, because Tom was pointing it at him, and ran off, taking his acolytes with him. Tom's story formed the centrepiece in DC and Heller in the United States, which overturned the Washington DC concealed carry ban. Tom's story was so effective precisely because it produced an intersection of two narratives, a gay rights narrative and a gun rights narrative. Had Tom not had a 9mm handgun, it is almost certain that he would be just another homophobic, bash-to-death statistic. Having a firearm saved his life. In the court case that ensued, it was Tom's evidence that was decisive. What I'm going to try to get across to you today is to join the dots. David's had quite a lot of trouble getting people to join the dots. People saying to him, how can you support freedom to marry and freedom to carry? Tom's story is an unusual example of two liberties intersecting. LGBT rights, which are generally viewed as left, and gun rights, which are generally viewed as right. And the reason that story is important is because most of the time, people do live in separate bubbles. That's how you finish up with situations where people say, I don't know anybody who voted for Tony Abbott, or... I don't know anybody who voted for Julia Gillard because we tend to isolate ourselves in communities where we don't talk to people unlike ourselves. This lack of intersection means that it's difficult to respect other people's liberties because you don't know what they like. What you have to do to respect the liberties that other people value is overcome what I call the ick factor. Ooh, ick. And the ick factor is very strong with both LGBT rights and gun ownership. The ick factor directed at queers takes the form of particularly directed at men as in ew, gay sex. Directed at queer women, you're deliberately barren, you're childless. Do you hate the family? Directed at recreational hunters. But you like killing things. And directed at anybody, even people who keep antique firearms. But that's inherently dangerous. Who do you think you are? Dirty Harry. Classical liberals have to approach the ick factor by presenting two arguments. The first derived from the harm principle, and the second, a realisation that we can't live in a world without risk. 
The harm principle is based on the idea from John Stuart Mill's On Liberty that if it's not hurting other people, then it's no concern of the government's. You may not like it. That's fine. You mightn't like the idea of hunting. You might think it's cruel. But other people don't. They disagree with you. You might think being homosexual is immoral. You might think that gay people shouldn't get married. But if you don't like gay marriage, then perhaps the best thing to do is to not get gay married. When we address the harm principle concerning these two issues, there's been extensive research on both gun ownership and and same-sex marriage. We find that guns don't contribute to the crime rate, despite what everyone would have you believe, and that gays make fine parents. At the moment, statistically, the data we have, probably because of a selection effect, is that gays actually produce slightly better outcomes for their children than straights do, although it is probably a selection effect. Crime rate is actually independent of gun ownership. America's homicide rate is high because Americans tend to solve their problems violently. If you magicked every gun away tomorrow with some sort of spell, the homicide rate would not change. They would find other ways to kill each other. It's nothing to do with guns. Yes, there is some evidence that buybacks in particular reduce suicide. But beware the suicide argument, because it makes a moral claim. People who use the suicide argument to justify gun buybacks and tight gun laws, they treat suicide as not only bad, but a crime. Suicide is no longer a crime, and we really don't want to go back to the sort of world where it was a crime. People killed themselves in the Middle Ages, for example, their property would be confiscated and would go to the church. And if they had a family and children, they would be destitute. You don't want to live in a world where suicide is a crime. Also, we don't want to live in a world where suicide is always considered bad. Because if it is always considered bad, it becomes impossible to argue for assisted suicide. Sometimes we have to accept that an individual can make a better decision about what they want to do with their life than the government, lawyers and doctors. Moving on to the second argument, keep John Stuart Mill's harm principle in one hand, but you keep another principle in the other. That is, that there is no such thing as a world without risk. Some things harm others. Cars harm others, bicycles harm others, motorcycles harm others. They very frequently harm the people who use them. Should we ban those as well while we're in our epidemic of banning? Backyard swimming pools, even fenced ones, are more dangerous to children than firearms in Australia, the United States, even the United Kingdom. And they don't actually have very many backyard swimming pools because the country is not really suited to swimming in one's backyard. Beware then of what about the children arguments because they are wheeled out every time one group of people wants to tell another group of people how to live. You can't eliminate risk entirely. It would mean, to paraphrase Tolkien, never going outside your front door. It is a dangerous business, going out your front door. But if you never do it, you'll never do anything. Sometimes our risk-averse culture produces extraordinary effects. One of my favourite stories from my days in practice was when a a young disabled man who had the characteristic extraordinary upper body strength of many people who use a wheelchair was denied access to a nightclub in Glasgow on the basis that his wheelchair constituted a fire hazard. So we had a massive conflict of rights anti-discrimination law, which includes disabled people, and health and safety law. This is a clear example where the regulatory state and our desire to protect us, the government's desire to protect us all from ourselves has gone completely bonkers. Yes, sometimes the people in the nightclub are going to trip over the disabled person's wheelchair. 
And that's all right, because you can't make a world free of risk. So what we need to be aware of when we talk about joining the dots, freedom to marry and freedom to carry, is that it is not the government's business to seize hold of one of these and adjust it accordingly and place it around the levers of power and twist to set the laws up entirely in their own favour. There's two reasons for that. The first is because in a democracy, you don't get to stay in charge all the time. The other lot may get in, and they get to take this from you, and they get to either twist the levers in the other direction, adjust this completely differently, or use this lever in a way that neither you nor your supporters had ever intended, perhaps like this. So the first thing to do as a classical liberal is to persuade people that pulling on the levers of power with your wonderful adjustable spanner is not necessarily a good thing. And that's really the stage that David is at at as our representative now. In the future, if there are more Liberal Democrat senators... The task becomes to build institutions that are neutral between claims. No, you don't get to do that to the people you don't like, and you don't get to do that to the people you don't like. You might want to think about what it would be like if it were done to you.